boycotted by Ian Paisley's Democratic Unionist Party, said Jesus the Guantanamo years in Pakistan. <laughs> and he's now giving us a free preview of his latest show, a Pope Benedict Bond villain. Hey. A.B. Phil with Oh, is this is kind of, kind of, yeah. yeah. kind of fantastically wonderful. And yet I can't help look at little orange things. And it, it just feels slightly organised. <laughs> I'm just like, any minute now, we're sort of marching down the Garbahi Road or something. <laughs> it's creepy, and I, I don't know that I'm... But no, it's lovely to be here. I think we, we, do, we probably do need to organise as, as a group. Uh, my name is Amy. I, I shall warn you, right now, I never wanted to be a comedian. Growing up here in Dublin, I desperately wanted to be a famous Irish novelist. <laughs> and tragically, I had a happy childhood. <laughs> um, largely due to the absence of religion, among other things. Uh, which is quite uh, enlightened with my parents. Um, but uh, no, it's, it was weird actually growing up as an atheist, because uh, I was, when I was about nine, I used to sort of be the annoying kid in religion class who would sit and ask awkward questions like, why does God kill people? God says don't kill. Isn't that really hypocritical? And all of the kids who've been going to religious school for years were like, Amy, it's religion, it's not supposed to make sense. And I was like, no! <laughs> this isn't really important. If you're going to give us a moral framework, this is, it's just, I was that nerd. And, um, and, you know, people will be like, you don't believe, you believe in nothing, you're, you're a sinner, you don't believe in a moral framework, I mean, at least you're not a Protestant, but still! <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was kind of the attitude. And then, when I was about 11 or 12, all the scandals came out, and I went, oh, you were right, I'm fair enough. Um, <laughs> I, I had no idea, okay. Um, it, it's a little bit like how I've experienced the recession, actually, because, uh, Basically, during the boom years, when everyone was like buying houses and getting jobs, I was I was living at home with my parents, completely refusing to take on any kind of adult responsibility. Uh, I didn't learn to drive. I didn't get a mortgage. I didn't get a job. Uh, I had this crazy dream of being a comedian. I didn't even drink tea. <laughs> I actually refused to drink alcohol on the grounds I'm already horny and overconfident. <laughs> would make me a totally shit Catholic. <laughs> I'm also gluten intolerant. So I can't have it. Thank you. Ah, you see, an atheist audience, you guys get this already. <laughs> I can't have the body or the blood of Jesus. Which is kind of awkward at communion. And I have actually, I've looked into whether or not you can get a gluten-free wafer. And interestingly, you can't, right? Uh, because apparently, if it doesn't contain gluten, in the Protestant tradition, it's fine, it's just representative, that's grand, but under the Catholic teaching, if it doesn't contain wheat and gluten, it doesn't represent the bread that Jesus ate at the Last Supper. Um, to which I replied, but hang on, didn't you say it transforms into the body of Jesus? Doesn't that mean that logically, if it's transformed, it wouldn't contain wheat anyway? So see, actually would have a normal wafer. Um, and they went, no, no, we've thought about this, it doesn't, it won't transform properly, and it'll, it'll mess with it. So, so, say what, you like. <laughs> say what you like about the, I mean, they may have covered up the abuse of millions of children worldwide, but at least they're theologically consistent about gluten. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I, uh, I, I grew up it, during the recession, I, as I said, I had no, no adult responsibility, lived at home, didn't have a job, didn't have a car, etc, etc. And I was a textbook loser. And then the financial crisis happened, and through no fault of my own, I became an economic genius. Uh, I haven't got a mortgage, I can't be fired, uh, and, and I have the most stable career ever. Try outsourcing this bullshit to China. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Quite a strange, quite a strange journey, but it, it's odd. It, it, Michael alluded to some of the, some of the things that I have gotten up to. Um, and and when, I was, when I wrote the Jesus show, uh, the Jesus thing, Guantanamo years that you, you heard a bit about, um, I actually wasn't trying to annoy every Christian I could. That wasn't actually the aim. But there's a particular brand of Christians who annoy the hell out of me. And to be fair, who annoy the hell out of most nice Christians that I know. <laughs> and this is the, the brand of very right-wing, evangelical, American Christian fundamentalists. The, the, the Sarah Palins and the George Bushes. People who say, you can't spell Jesus without U.S. <laughs> <laughs> you know that 
grand, really judgmental, vindictive, it's all gonna end and you're all gonna die, ha ha ha. That kind of, that kind of, and I don't mind them being American, that's fine. I don't mind them being Christian, I actually, that's okay with me. What annoys me is that they are total hypocrites, because we all know that if Jesus came back now, there's no way he would get through US immigration. <laughs> he is a bearded Middle Eastern man who wishes to die as a martyr. <laughs> Suit and my long hair and the crown of thorns, and with the whole, you know, Jesus, they wanted, you know, in Guantanamo, that's how it would look. Um, to try and make the point. And to be honest, the weird thing is, right, I travelled to America with this and they got fine, no problem. Pakistan! I am the only Western comedian stupid enough to do religious, political comedy <laughs> in a Muslim country during a state of emergency. <laughs> They came along and they were like, yes, clearly the fundamentalists have got this wrong, and thank you for pointing out that Guantanamo is really stupid. Um, you know, and, and it is. I mean, Guantanamo is, is if I was to explain it, it's, it's kind of like a maximum security prison, but designed and run by Kentucky Fried Chicken. Because <laughs> you've got the battery side wire mesh cages and the horrible uniforms. And, like, you know the people in charge are, like, evil men in suits, you know, sitting in offices trying to take over the world. But all you meet face to face are ignorant teenagers with no other career choices. <laughs> <laughs> and the food is awful. <laughs> so it really is, you know, the closest thing to, to, to KFC. You know, and imagine being trapped in your local KFC for a month. <laughs> imagine what that would do to your soul. I mean, I know you don't have soul, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Speaking allegorically, you know what that would do to your, to your soul. Um, oh, time was up and not serious. I think I've lost you now, shit. <laughs> It was going so well, and then you made oh, what? Uh, uh, atheism, scary. I'll get a schism going, like splitters, splitters. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so I had a great time in, in Pakistan and America and all sorts of places. And then I go to actually bizarrely, the one place I got picked at was in Dunleary. <laughs> Supposedly the most liberal constituency in the country. I had people outside going, this is blasphemous and that's terrible. And I had the classic, you know, we've had, we all had the art of blasphemy. So you're telling me you believe in a God who created everything and is the creator of the universe, but who is more offended by me telling jokes than by, for instance, the American army torturing his children. <laughs> really, that's the guy you, okay, fine. And, and I had this row with the DUP as you do. And in the middle of this room with the DUP, I had this, just this moment of going, oh my God, I am being attacked by an Ulster Protestant for dressing in orange and talking about Jesus. <laughs> For anyone, anyone, okay, with anyone remotely interested in, I imagine being atheist were probably mostly Republican in the sense of actually knowing what that word means and respecting the democratic will of the people, kind of a way. Um, but <laughs> rather than the, yes, I respect the will of the, I'm going to blow people up. Well, what? No, that doesn't make sense. Um, that thing, the kind of, I will, yes, the sort of, this Al Qaeda ish mentality of, yes, we will help the children of Palestine by blowing up a commuter train in London. <laughs> Which is like me saying, well, I've got mice in my kitchen, I will fly to Botswana and shoot a giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it doesn't make any sense. Still not making any sense. If you don't believe me that those guys are completely morons, watch the videos that they make. They're hilarious. They say things like, we've told you so many times to get out of Muslim lands. And you're thinking, all right, dude, but you're a Pakistani bloke living in Walthamstow. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, you're welcome, but don't get all BNP on our asses. <laughs> and uh, they always end the videos, always, with the phrase, Death to the West! 
yet they're clearly using Windows Movie Maker. <laughs> I went up north for, for a gig, it was a lovely, lovely gig. I, I do actually love playing in Northern Ireland because they have such a wonderful attitude to the whole, you know, everyone else is so freaked out by the war on terror. And in Belfast, they're just much more chill about the whole thing. For fairly obvious reasons. Um, there, was, there was a case a few years back of a crazy Islamist who, who set his car on fire and drove it into Glasgow Airport. And uh, people around the world, this is shocking, this is terrible. I mean, he's beaten up by a baggage handler, which is hilarious. But, I mean, the first thing, you know, they're driving, like, this is awful. And people in Northern Ireland were like, that's just fucking incompetent. <laughs> That's no way to bomb an airport. <laughs> what was they thinking? <laughs> so, uh, so I was, I was doing a gig uh, for the Cathedral Quarter Arts Festival uh, in, on the 27th of last month. Which was, it happened was the day before the royal wedding, and normally I would not give a crap about the royal wedding, but I was in Belfast, and I thought, I've read this Daryl O'Brien thing, maybe some of you guys read it, uh, about uh, Andrew Maxwell spent the entire last summer World Cup going to various different boroughs in London to watch every game with the fans from that part of the world, like so Ghana was playing somewhere he'd go to a Ghanaian pub and whatever. And I thought, right, I'm in Belfast for the royal wedding. I'm going to a bar on the Shankill Road. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, uh, I was great, I went got a taxi up there, and I tell you, it's the one time in my life that having quite a posh D4 accent has actually lowered my chances of getting the shit kicked out of me. Because <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't quite play, they were like, the English, we're not going to win, it's very hard to judge. Um, yes, Tom in a Honeen, or I'm a West Brit, for those of you who don't speak Gaelic. Um, but, uh, but no, it was great, because I, I wanted to blend in, I didn't say very much, I was quite out of character. Um, and I, I just said, look, can, can I, have, I don't drink, so I have an orange juice. And they went, oh, actually, we're out of orange. I thought, oh, the irony! <laughs> <laughs> a UDA a bar out of orange on the day of the royal wedding. And uh, it, was, it was quite a sweet story, the whole royal wedding. It was, you know, it was, you know, Prince William and Kate Middle Class. You know, they <laughs> seemed to like each other. This, you know, it was kind of sweet. Was that lovely moment when, when Prince William gave Kate Middlebrow the ring. You know, his mother's ring. And it was, you know, it was kind of sweet because you could see that the ring mattered very much. Uh, to, to him and, and also to her, and it was like that moment in Lord of the Rings when, <laughs> when Frodo gives the ring to Bilbo. Or sorry, Bilbo gives the ring to Frodo. So I got up. And you can get your Bible wrong, mate, but don't mess up Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> we have our creation bits as well, you bastards. Okay, sorry about that. Whoa. Yeah. So anyway, you know, that moment in that, because it's a lovely scene when, when Bilbo hands up, and you can see the ring really matters to Bilbo, and, and it's a really emotional moment, but everybody else watching is thinking, you have no idea how much shit this is going to cause. <laughs> <laughs> you just wait till the end of the movie. <laughs> um, but it was, it was quite nice to have, I, I was quite impressed when the Queen actually turned up to hear, uh, I was, she was quite nice. I, I, I mean, you know, like, okay, I'm not a monarchist at all, but I kind of, at some level, I kind of respect the Queen for being, you know, a, a diplomat for as long as she has been, and I think she's quite a politically astute woman. You know, I think she's realised the only way she can save the British monarchy is by never dying. <laughs> <laughs> But 20 minutes into the reign of King Charles and Duchess Camilla, the entire British population would be on eBay going, how do you spell guillotine? <laughs> it's a weird sort of irony that I think Prince Di Princess Diana is actually going to end up saving the British monarchy because her kids are now the ones who will inherit the throne. And, you know, people really respect Princess Diana. She does all that great work for, for uh, you know, landmines and human rights and seatbelts. collection of overweight uh, businessmen essentially talk, getting together to discuss ethically grown organic knighthoods. 
weird fucking gig. But um, I, I made the mistake of opening with a Prince Charles joke, which as an Irish person I felt I should do. I said, I look, I just wanted you to know, I quite like Prince Charles. I actually have a Prince Charles commemorative teapot. It never rains, but it pours. <laughs> yeah. Oh, whoa, oh, that's more devices than the Diana. Okay, right. So bad puns, dead princesses are all. Okay, fine. We have, a, we have a clear moral framework. That's important. You know? Surely that's the point of this weekend, is to establish some kind of moral boundaries. If this is acceptable, this is not. We can still live together like fairy tales. Lovely. We're making progress, people. This is good. Uh, <laughs> So, no, I was, I was up in the north, and I, I, should, I should sort of balance out the comments about, because the, the lawyer's probably was actually quite welcoming, and, and I ended up wearing a little bowler hat with a huge jack design. It was made in China, so I didn't feel like too much of a trade. <laughs> um, and they're, they're very welcoming, and they're generally very nice people. I've, I've met one or two people from the north who, who, who refer to me as Mexican. And <laughs> a big, big, you've heard this probably, some of you, have, they're from down south, are Mexicans. And, and you know, they, they, what's that about? They, well, you're from south of the border. And I'm like, okay, I see where you're going here, but I think there is also a sort of a, a prejudiced kind of stereotype wrapped up in that, which is the idea that we're basically, you know, poor, filthy, and overwhelmingly Catholic, right? That's kind of the, the stereotype that's going to play on. And I can't help point out to these people that geographically, if the Republic of Ireland is Mexico, well then logically Northern Ireland is Texas. <laughs> Stereotypically speaking, would be uh, overweight bigots who are overly fond of guns. <laughs> if the cat fits, you know. <laughs> it's quite, I mean, it's lovely to be in the North End, because obviously we've got peace, which is wonderful. I think it's brilliant that a community of white, English-speaking, Western European Christians who are predominantly heterosexual can finally put aside their differences. <laughs> and a community of white, English-speaking, Western European Christians who are predominantly heterosexual after a mere 35 years since that's a sectarian bloodshed. <laughs> I think that's you know, a, real, a real model for the Middle East and the same <laughs> Oh look, you get on because you have everything in common. <laughs> in, in the interest of balance, I should probably point out that I, I had the opportunity uh, to uh, have a go at uh, Jerry Adams as well recently. We were having an election on and uh, he, was, he was running in loud and uh, he came into the studio, I was doing a bit of radio stuff and I couldn't resist saying to him, because we had this huge financial debate about, you know, what should we do? And I said, Jerry, did you ever consider the slogan, Vote Sinn Féin. We'll burn the bondholders. <laughs> <laughs> we know where they live. <laughs> Canary Wharf. I just... Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> we're, not, we're not sure about... Okay, so, anyway, I, that, that's just... I, I felt I had to, to, you know, balance that out, and I did. We had a bit of a chat. He didn't. He didn't like that particular question. Um, <laughs> curiously, though, I also I said, look, I'm not going to be offensive. I mean, really, Jerry. To be fair, if any uh, party in our recent election, if any party, are experienced at renegotiating with bankers in high pressure situations, <laughs> I mean, you guys really are good at that. You know, you have an established track record. So, you know, don't let me hold that against you at all. Um, you know, there are still, of course, questions about Jeremy's past, and, you know, they haven't gone away, you know. Um, <laughs> there you are. So anyway, I, I should probably start to tell you the story that I was going to try and tell you today, uh, which is uh, basically a show I'm working on uh, called Pope Benedict, Bond Villain. Um, and the basic idea is, is I mean, I really, I, as I said earlier, I'm not really a Catholic uh, for many reasons. Uh, one of them that I don't believe in God. But, uh, <laughs> and I can't have communion and all that stuff. But really, a big part of it, I genuinely, I look at the Pope, I do not see an infallible man. I see the closest thing we have ever seen or will ever see to the world's greatest and most diabolical Bond villain. <laughs> I mean, he's got everything. Sh dodgy German accent. <laughs> shadowy Nazi past. <laughs> lives in a huge mansion full of priceless artworks. <laughs> His own specially trained staff and security guards in their own uniforms. <laughs> and he heads a sinister organisation which is trying to take over the world. <laughs> Really, as, as the, I, I, I ask. I, I, he really, he is, he is. And, and also, I think, I mean, I've got the Pope Mobile, which is just beyond parody, but. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever noticed that every really sinister Bond villain has a public name that sounds totally innocent, like, you know, Pope Benedict? <laughs> and then a real name, which is really sinister and scary, like Joseph Ratzinger. <laughs> 
practically hear Sean Connery going, you'll never get away with this sort of thing. <laughs> oh, but I will, Mr. Bond, say your prayers. <laughs> Cardinal, take Mr. Bond away, read him his last right. <laughs> I suppose you expect me to talk. No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. And ascend to heaven, where you'll be judged by our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Unless, of course, you're a Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in, in my head, the film is called Octopopy. <laughs> or perhaps Popey Galore, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, again, that's a bit... Oh, hmm. Interesting stuff you don't like. <laughs> I feel kind of bad though because I, I refused, I absolutely refused to have James Bond in the show in any shape or form. I can't stand James Bond for many, many reasons. One of which is the fact that he almost definitely went to school with David Cameron. <laughs> um, and in fact, I'm, I'm convinced, because if you've ever watched Bond films, he's always going to these really fancy cocktail parties and hobnobbing with international, you know, evil people, but also, you know, diplomats, etc. And I'm convinced his permanent fear is he's at this, you know, thing, buying up all the different spies and people he has to keep an eye on. And beautiful women, of course. And he's rugby tackled from behind by Boris Johnson, going, Bond! Hello, how are you? Are you the Baron Von Evil Butter? Be Bond, you are still undercover at MI6. Bond! Uh, and I just think that would be quite funny. Um, but, but perhaps perhaps not so much for an Irish audience who are vaguely aware that Boris Johnson, isn't he a guy who used to do white news for you? Sorry. Um, so, uh, yeah, he just, he, he annoys me. And one of the things I'm really trying to get to the core of in the show is, is why is it, right, and this affects us all, I think, why is it that we're in the middle of this financial crisis where essentially Protestant Europe is bailing out Catholic Europe, right? All the countries being bailed out, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Italy. No, I mean, I know the Greeks are Orthodox, but they're not really Orthodox, really. They're not really Catholic or Protestant. Um, and their accounting certainly isn't Orthodox. It's, you know, can believe what we read, which I don't know that we can. But it's weird that it's all the Catholic countries, the ones, and all the Protestant countries are the ones doing the bailing out, the UK, Germany, Scandinavia, Holland, etc. you know? And I'm trying to think, what, what is it about the Catholic mindset that, that does that, you know? And, and I suppose what, I, what I got, got me really thinking was that like a thousand years ago, like kings and, and rulers would say, well, we're going to do this in the name of God. God has appointed me, and I want you to do a shitty job, and we're all going to go and invade the Middle East because we're going to reclaim that God's land from God, even though he, he's given the land to us and also to the ones of people who live there, which <laughs> makes God somewhat between a dodgy real estate sale and a really needy girl going, fight over me, fight over me! Which is, which is weird, right? <laughs> So, so that, that was like a thousand years ago, and fast forward a thousand years, and today we get some guy going, vote for me, I'm going to save the country and do a shitty job, we're going to invade the Middle East for the oil, and it's all for the sake of the economy. And it's like God's been replaced by the economy, this big nebulous thing that nobody really understands, but we really have to do stuff or it's going to go really pear-shaped. Right? And it was like, oh, we want to go to heaven, we want to heaven's good, hell is bad, heaven good, hell bad. Now it's like, rich good, poor bad. Do the good things, you'll be rich, hey, hooray. And it's like, it's just the same fucking bullshit we're being asked to do. And, and I, I, I think there's something in the, in the sort of the Catholic sort of psychology, which essentially is, look, if you want to get to heaven, sit there, don't ask any questions, realize the magic words, and pay no attention to the man behind the, cor can, uh, the curtain. Right? That would, would be funnier if I hadn't fucked up the line. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the Protestant thing is a bit more like, well, here's the book, read it for yourself, see what you think, you know? Get back to as many questions. Which, I have to say, I'm slightly more drawn to. Uh, even though that makes me a traitor to my culture. And, um, it's weird, because we now live in a country which I think, I think Irish people are, are starting to wake up with this. I do think that's good. I think, you know, a lot of Irish people, most of them would still say they believe in God. Fair enough, that's their prerogative. But, but, you know, most of them would still identify as Catholic, again, that's their prerogative. But they're asking questions. They're saying things like, well, maybe contraception isn't such a bad idea, you know? And, and maybe if, if priests should be allowed to marry, maybe that's a lesser of two evils, if nothing else. <laughs> and maybe divorce isn't the worst thing in the world. So I think we now live in the only country in the world where the vast majority of people are Catholics and the vast majority of Catholics are Protestants. <laughs> and it's really confusing, and I, I don't quite know why that is or, or how that works, but it seems to me the lesson of, of places like Egypt is that power is consensual, right? and, and we all you know, choose and decide whether or not we want it to consent. And, and God used to be the way we could force people to consent, and now it's money. And uh, 
I feel like, like you know, an act of resistance might be to say, well, I'm not going to earn very much money, and if, if the IMF wants to repossess 90% of my jokes, they are fucking welcome. <laughs> they can have 85% of my punchlines, they might even boost the German economy, maybe the Germans need that. Um, I mean, the IMF has just turned into its own wonderfully surreal joke with the whole Dominique Strauss-Kahn situation. I mean, you know, this is the guy who's supposedly head of the IMF, in charge of all this money, uh, staying in a $1,850 hotel suite a night, and then tries to rape a chambermaid. And as awful and terrible and long as that is, a part of my brain went, Jesus man, you could have taken the Holiday Inn, got a really good call girl, and still saved money. <laughs> I'm not saying that's a moral thing I endorse, I'm just saying, you know, if you're spending this financial fucking whiz kid, prioritise your resources accordingly. This is your fucking cutbacks and harsh pay and difficult decisions and compromises. Bastard. <laughs> um, and we, is there anything else I desperately need to talk about? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 feel, I feel one of the weird things that, that happens a bit, and this is something I've noticed here in Ireland and also in the UK a bit, and, and even in America with, with, with Obama, um, who I have some sympathy for. I mean, he didn't close Guantanamo, I'm a bit annoyed about that. But at the same time, I kind of feel like electing Barack Obama in the current climate is a bit like getting a really thoughtful liberal college professor and asking him to look after a class of, kid, of dyslexic five-year-olds with ADHD. <laughs> you can't expect all his liberal ideals to remain intact, you know. <laughs> and especially because he has such a strange name, you know. People think, you know, they, oh, Barack Obama, how exotic, how strange. And, and I think his parents could have made that a hell of a lot easier if they'd just given him a more American-sounding first name. If they'd just called him Al. I mean, who could claim that Alabama doesn't send America? <laughs> really? Does this make sense? I mean, to be fair, being his parent, they would have messed the whole thing up by giving the middle name Jazeera. Um, <laughs> You know, screwed everything up. Um, but no, what annoys me is, is this thing that happened, happened with Obama, it's happened with, with uh, Nick Clegg recently in the UK, it happened a bit with, with Brian Cowan and Virgil Herman before, and, and with Tony Blair before that. It's this thing where we, we sort of all fall madly collectively in love with this with a politician and go, oh my god, he's the new guy who's going to change everything and sort us all out. And then inevitably, oh my god, he's a lying chief bastard who we hate. Right? <laughs> that journey that we've all been going on with, you know, a bunch of different politicians. And, and at some point, I'm starting to think, maybe it's not them, maybe it's us, right? And I, what I mean by that is, like, you know, we all have a, a, a female friend who, who every kind of year or two is like, oh my god, that's this amazing guy, he's really good at debating, he's kind of geeky, he's cute but only I can see it. Um, and he's, he's like the most amazing guy ever. And then a year later, oh my god, this lying bastard, he's a bastard, he dumped me, etc, etc. And that can happen to anybody once or twice. But if it keeps happening, at some point you have to say, listen girl, you really need to get more control of your life and, and really love your, respect yourself a bit more and, and, you know, not believe in this like wonderful guy who's going to ride on a white charger and save the day, you know? And maybe politically we need to do something uh, along those lines. Although, given the options we have in this country, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good, I suppose it's good that our, the leader of the Irish Labour Party, Eamon Gilmore, for once, we have a leader of the Labour Party whose name does not sound like an Australian sex toy. <laughs> or I'll show like a uh, Dick Spring, a pet rabbit, and a bath dog. Lovely. <laughs> Seriously, you know. Those just sound like weird sex toys. Fair enough. And, and, you know, we have Enda Kenny, who is, let, let's be honest, not, not the most inspiring uh, of leaders. Uh, I, I, to me, the only way, I'm trying to explain Enda Kenny to my friends internationally. And, I mean, initially I was like, how do I do this? It's quite tricky. Um, I mean, to be fair, to put it in some kind of perspective, I mean, obviously Americans had to explain George W. Bush for eight years. Um, <laughs> Russian people have to explain Vladimir Putin's ongoing midlife crisis. <laughs> the Italians have to explain Silvio Berlusconi. Uh, I mean, whatever end of Kenny's failings, I'm pretty sure he'll never be accused of having bunga bunga parties for underage Algerian laptops. <laughs> Just a hunch I have. <laughs> But, uh, but no, how do you explain it? I, I don't know. The only, the only term I can really, the only analogy I can draw is he's kind of like one of our other quite successful exports. He's kind of the political equivalent of Enya. <laughs> <laughs> In the middle of the road, he drones on and on, and everyone I know is way too embarrassed to admit they like him. <laughs> 
think we collectively start referring to him as Anya Kenny. Um, and whenever he starts talking, just in your head, just saying, sail away, sail away, sail away. <laughs> Which seems to be what everyone is basically doing. Um, I have been trying to think of schemes to rescue the Irish economy. Uh, I thought we could put Jedward on eBay, that would be good. Um, I actually think we missed a trick. I think we should have given Joan Burton the finance ministry. I mean, you know, like, I think, I think half an hour with Joan Burton, the IMF would give us anything we could. <laughs> half an hour with Joan Burton, Vincent Brown and Jedward, we would own Germany. <laughs> You know, seriously. And, and don't, don't give me, I'm not trying to, I'm not going to have a, a job. I actually quite like Joan Burton. I think not enough women in Irish politics, and I, I think she's one of the good ones. I, I like her, I respect her. I just hope she never gets a job answering phones from Samaritans. <laughs> <laughs> That's not in anyone's interest, let's, let's be fair. Um, wow. <laughs> I mean, it would technically reduce unemployment, but no, not a good thing. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Again, that, that, that doesn't come out, I don't know. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't meaning to. <laughs> but no, it's, it's, we're, we're in this really tough situation, and, and what can we do? Uh, I mean, one thought I had is we could try and work out the assets we do actually have, right? Uh, one of them, apparently, is that the Irish accent is apparently quite sexy. Right? This is, there was an international poll done a few years ago. Uh, there were five accents that were regarded as the most attractive in the world. Uh, and number five was, I think, Australian, uh, and then uh, French, and then Scottish, and then Italian, and then Irish. Right? Now, I would like to try this. I, I, I'm going to see if... You know the way that the, the Ukrainians and the Chinese have cornered the market on? Ukrainianbrides.com. And they have these awful, awful like slogans like, do you, do you find Western women in feminist bitches? We, we, you know, Eastern women are far more submissive. This is what you need. And it's awful, like horrendous things just pop up on your screen all the time. Not with women at all. <laughs> and I think, I think we might have. I, I think, how about the slogan, do you want a man who's too drunk or guilty to have an affair? <laughs> Respond, this would be great. Um, I'm going to just try a chat up line in each of those accents and just see how you feel about it. Um, an Australian chat up line would be something like, now he says he's getting sandy, Nick of Love, you are there, all guys kind of want <laughs> Okay, not so much. Um, right, a French chat up line would be, my love for you is like a cafe au lait, hot, warm, and very milky. <laughs> so far, not a great response, I'm going to have to say, okay. Uh, a Scottish chat of line. If you batter my sausage, I will batter yours. <laughs> oh, right. We like the Scottish option, okay? All right. Clearly winning so far. Uh, let me think, an Italian chat of line would be... Come back to my villa, who will make sweet, sweet love. But in the morning, breakfast in bed, served by my mama. <laughs> okay, I think Scotland is still winning, to be fair. Um, and the, an Irish side of line now, I guess, would be, Holly, can I borrow 20 quid so I can get you drunk? <laughs> like a very tight Six Nations game. Okay, good. <laughs> Ireland, Scotland, and Italy all battling it out. It's good. I like to see that. It's good. It's good. Actually, rugby is, is, is the one, one of the few gleams of hope in this country right now. Because we finally, finally as a people, we've worked out the key to sporting success is to concentrate on sports that very few other countries take seriously. <laughs> I mean, seriously, only about eight countries in the world give a toss about rugby. And two of them are Scotland and Wales. <laughs> and no offence to our beloved Celtic brethren, etc. But, you know, I mean, you know, we can probably do okay there. When it comes to international rules, we are guaranteed a silver medal at international level. Uh, hurling, we are the undisputed champions of the world. <laughs> Take that, People's Republic of China. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're we're going to straight into today. I uh, I suppose I should I should probably uh, where are we at? Actually, oh, time is sort of marching on. Um, I did want to briefly talk about some of the other bullshit that religion does, which is stuff from other shows that I've done. Um, but uh, there were some, there were some, it was hilarious. I actually didn't want to start the show because uh, Mr. Dawkins here was having a wonderful, Professor Dawkins even, was having a wonderful argument outside with some with some Islamic guys. Are they still here? 
And they know they may have gone there. Comedy is really... And by the way, I want to make it clear, I'm not... I, I feel like Islam has given a pretty rough pr uh, ride in the, in the Western press. I mean, you know, the way you read it, it's as if every Muslim is some kind of Al-Qaeda suicide bomber. I think it's worth remembering, there are 1.3 billion Muslims in the world. Okay? That means even if there were 13 million Al-Qaeda suicide bombers, that would be 1% of Islam. And there's nothing like 13 million, and the number of suicide bombers is actually going down all the time. <laughs> You know, God or Jesus or whatever. People can be, oh, oh, you flag off Jesus, but you wouldn't flag off Muhammad, would you? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. She's scared, aren't you? I'm like, well, hang on a second. First of all, uh, <coughs> you know nothing about Islam, because um, if you did, you'd know that Jesus is a prophet in Islam. Thus, for me to depict Jesus in a Muslim country like Pakistan is blasphemous and should have got me beheaded. Particularly given that Bin Laden was actually in the country at the fucking time. <laughs> Which I only realise now, of course, but still, a little bit freaky. Um, but no, I mean, the main reason, I, I do jokes about the veil, I jokes about suicide bombing, I jokes about Islamism, no problem with any of that. But the main reason I don't do jokes about, or many jokes about the Prophet Muhammad, is because basically Western audiences tend not to know a hell of a lot about him. Uh, I usually say to people, right, can you tell me Muhammad's parents' names? Anybody? No. No, didn't think so. Or how he died, right? Very hard to tell a story when people don't have any reference points, right? One of the things people, I think, do know is that Muhammad was illiterate, right? he couldn't read or write. In fact, I think feel quite sorry for Muhammad, because he couldn't read or write, he wasn't even allowed to look at cartoons. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder he found the religion, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, so, so we know the Quran was written down, and we know it was dictated by him, but we don't know the circumstances in which it was written. So, for example, it is perfectly conceivable that Muhammad and his mates went out one night, and had a fantastic night, got really, really drunk, right? <laughs> Arrived home at four in the morning, had a massive fry of rashers, sausages, blackberry, <laughs> the whole lot, right? And he woke up the next day at 12 o'clock and, oh, wow, peace be upon me. <laughs> <laughs> I am never doing that again. <laughs> no, seriously, no, no, write that down. <laughs> What I find more amusing to joke about is the ridiculous ideology of the people who use his name to blow people up, which I alluded to earlier. Especially when it comes to these people, their views on sex are fucking hysterical, right? The basic Islamist Taliban position on sex is all women have to wear the veil. Now, personally, I think if you choose to wear the veil as an expression of your culture or your religious identity, personally, I haven't got a problem with that, apart from certain security situations, but generally I think it's cool, right? If you say all women have to wear the veil, what you were effectively saying is, Allah the Almighty has created everyone, and that there shall be no premarital sex. But your hair is so fabulous, if I even glimpse it, I will lose all self-control. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of like a weird parallel universe L'Oreal ad going, for hair so shiny, and of every religion lose all theological perspective. <laughs> <laughs> to both and control the Bolivar for Garnier Cabot, because you're worth it. <laughs> <laughs> And then the same people who say this turn around and go, ah, ah, but if you die as a suicide bomber, you will go to heaven and you will have 72 virgins. Now, uh, all that really tells me is that these guys have no practical real-life experience <laughs> of relationships with adult women. <laughs> <laughs> because if they did, they would promise you 72 women who've just left a really unsupported boyfriend. <laughs> basically have this view that, that God doesn't approve of sex. Sex is something that is sinful, unless you're sort of married and engaging in it for procreation to you create a child you will then brainwash into said religion. Apart from that, it's sinful and wrong and evil and bad. Despite the fact that it's the same people who tell you God made everything, and God sees everything. So God has seen every sexual act that has ever taken place in the history of the world. He's also seen every piece of pornography ever made in the history, not just when it was what made, but when it was every subsequent viewing of it, you know, after that. So, logically, by their rationale, that either means God is guilty of incredibly poor 
more forward planning, or he's a bit of a perv. <laughs> and those are kind of your only two options if you, if you follow that. Um, and what, what, what really, what kind of upsets me more than that is actually the fact that all of these religions are quite homophobic, right? Despite the fact that Jesus said, put plainly, love thy neighbour, right? Uh, the, the Quran clearly states, God makes glorious all that he creates, right? And um, not only that, but pretty much every religion tells you, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, for my money, homosexuality is the embodiment of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Word for word, stroke, etc. So, I find that kind of weird. And, and I mean, look, I, I have some sympathy. I've, I've got an uncle who is Oklahomophobic, which is a fear of gay men and musicals. <laughs> <laughs> He's just never been the same since rent. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's a strange one. I, you know, and, and we end up having this ridiculous religious inspired debate of, you know, is it okay for homosexual people to get married? That is completely the wrong debate. What we should be debating is, is it okay for homophobic people to get married? <laughs> and let me make it clear, I think homophobia is disgusting, and immoral, and probably unchristian. But, at the same time, I'm a liberal. So I think if two homophobic people really love each other, <laughs> and they want to meet behind closed doors, as consenting adults, in private, that's kind of their business. You know. I mean, I, I don't think we should let them to adopt children, obviously. That's, 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 there's no way a vulnerable child should think that kind of disgusting, depraved behaviour is, is somehow normal. Um, but, and, and people worry that maybe the children would grow up homophobic, you know, and we don't know. I mean, the truth is, some people think that it's a lifestyle choice, and some people think homophobes are just born that way. <laughs> and I couldn't tell you, honestly, I have no idea. Uh, the one concession I will make, I think we should allow them to serve in the army, uh, preferably towards the front. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, maybe in Benghazi, that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, mean, I, was, I was watching the thing about Colonel Gaddafi the other day, and I, I, I had this moment of going, hang on a second. If you're an oil-rich dictator, right, and you spend 40 years repressing your own people, funding international terrorism, and running your own country and army. And after 40 years, you haven't passed the rank of colonel. It's time to fucking go! <laughs> I mean, take a fucking hint, would you? So, um, so I think I should probably, I'll probably finish up soon. I, I just wanted to briefly tell you a story about the night Barack Obama was elected. Uh, I, I thought it would be quite a good idea to interview the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> uh, not because I like them, not at all, no, 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 but because basically I, I, I think that, you know, it's important when a group like the KKK, who has a long and colourless history, um, <laughs> when they are totally and completely defeated, I think it's important to mark that occasion with as much pomp and ceremony as possible, just to rub it in, you know. <laughs> much as I would love to have interviewed Hitler just as the Allied tanks rolled into Berlin. <laughs> Going, you're not going to win this, mate. How do you feel? <laughs> Talk us through where it went wrong for you, Adolf. Did you wake up in the morning and think, oh, of course, Napoleon? <laughs> <laughs> I like when people get that joke. That's nice. <laughs> History geeks. <laughs> Woo. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm obviously I'm Irish. I, we, know, we all know our history backwards, quite literally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually weird doing gigs in the UK, because, I mean, there, there are certain bits of history they're brilliant on. Like, they are fantastic on Henry VIII and Hitler. But anything in between, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> That's kind of their sense of, oh, it's, it's, it's quite all over the place. Um, but the KKK, an interesting group of people, well, I mean, mad, but interesting. <laughs> I should probably explain that, that last year, uh, when the um, when the uh, was it World Cup was on, and there was a game between England and America, and, and my brain is a bit broken. I, all I could think during that game was, Jesus, I wonder who the Taliban are cheering for. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be quite a dilemma if you're a hardcore Islamic fundamentalist and a soccer fan. You know, you've got to be slightly torn. So when, when Obama got it, I thought this is a moment to you know really 
pretty rubbish in and, and let these guys, you know, know, what, know what, what they think is kind of nonsense. And, and I started out by asking them a very open question, give them lots of rope, let them lynch themselves. Um, <laughs> was the basic plan. I said, you know, what do you make of, of Barack Obama, the, you know, the first mixed race president to be elected? And the guy said, well, you know, uh, I was waiting for a torrent of racist abuse. And what I got was, well, Obama's a Marxist. And I thought, well, two thoughts went to my head. One is, the Ku Klux Klan have clearly done some PR training. <laughs> Does that explain the advanced highlights of Terry Prone? Just popped into my brain. And, right up. Maybe. Oh, we've got some Terry Prone fans in. Oh, really? Pardon me? Okay, well, no one knows who Terry Prone is. For which I love you. <laughs> it's so good that you don't. It's better that nobody knows. We should just gradually just, you know, like, they want to shake our just, just take her out of his. Just rewrite history in a, in a, in a, a, a better version. Um, it's a bit, bit dark, maybe. It wasn't going to go there. The second thought was, I'm actually going to have to argue with this man. So, we argued. I said, well, he's Marxist, really, because... I think what you'll find is that right now George Bush is using taxpayers' money to bail out America's banks, which is kind of a form of nationalisation and out of such a cornerstone of socialism. And he said, yes, yes it is. And I thought, oh shit, I'm agreeing with the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't really meant to happen. So, uh, <laughs> so we, we chatted a bit more, and, and eventually, uh, I, I, after seven or eight minutes, well, I really got to ask him a question about Brexit. So I said, look, the, the whole Ku Klux Klan ideology is that, this, that mixed race marriage is somehow wrong or sinful. Um, does that mean Barack Obama would be a better president, in your view, if both of his parents were black? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like that question. <laughs> got, got quite angry at it. And, uh, and, and I, I was like, well, just, I'm, I'm just asking because, you know, I mean, the, the KKK member, he, he actually said race is not an issue with us. And I said, really? <laughs> according to your website, you only allow members who are of pure European descent, and who don't date people of other races, and don't adopt children of other races, and also who aren't atheists or homosexuals or insane. On which grounds I qualify at least one and a half reasons I can. <laughs> <laughs> I leave it to you to decide which at least one and a half. Um, and uh, and he, he basically said to me, well, you know, no, that's not an issue. And I said, well, hang on, because Sarah Palin is married to a man who's part Inuit. Barack Obama is not entirely white. And uh, John McCain has adopted children from Bangladesh. So in many ways, Joe Biden was their great white hope. <laughs> but what really confuses me, Pastor Pierce, is the fact that you say you're against mixed race marriage, but given that Jesus' mother was a Palestinian Jew, and his father was God, <laughs> Jesus He didn't really like that question. <laughs> He got quite angry. In fact, he started out quite well. He said, well, no, man was good in God's image. I thought, I can't really. I mean, I don't believe it, but I can't argue that one very well. And then he said he landed himself right in it and went, oh, and Mary was, in fact, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman from Northern Europe who was kidnapped, get this, enslaved, and taken to Palestine where she had sex with God in March of the year zero, if my maths is correct. <laughs> And this is what this man believes. And, and I, just to prove to myself how bonkers he was, uh, I went on his, I went the website afterwards. If you're looking, it's kkkkupasan.bz, uh, which either means they're in league with Beelzebub, uh, <laughs> or slightly more likely, statistically, at least in this room, uh, is that they've registered their domain name in Belize, a Central American country full of non-white people. <laughs> Which, by the way, means a supposed patriotic organisation registering somewhere else to avoid paying their taxes kind of makes them quite similar to you too, in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> the other obvious similarity between the Ku Klux Klan and you too is they both have an old white lineup. To be fair, actually, oh, you care about Africa, do you, Bonham? Not enough of a black drummer, you racist bastard. <laughs> And they have this thing, which, which kind of freaked me out a bit, which said that, um, it was a thing that said, the Ku Klux Klan is not, it's not a charity. I, I worked that out. <laughs> <laughs> but by far the best thing on their website was the line, the Ku Klux Klan is not a dating organisation. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, who makes that mistake? <laughs> Blonde woman in my area. 
<laughs> I, I really don't care what she looks like, uh, as long as she has nice eyes and she's good at laundry. <laughs> They're my only two I love the thought that somewhere in cyberspace is a confused, slightly horny Islamic fundamentalist thinking she lives in America, but that white pointy bracket is so sexy. <laughs> Of course, as a comedian, my brain is thinking, you know, I'm sort of writing Ku Klux Klan Lonely Hearts ads. <laughs> um, which, you know, things like, um, mature Aryans seek spice to eat a for midnight marches, late night lynchings, an erection of thousands year right. <laughs> Must have own bunker. <laughs> There's a cross in my heart. Can you set it on fire? <laughs> Because I went away and I thought about all this, right? Because their whole ideology in the KKK is that mixed race marriage is a bad idea, right? And yet they say they're not related to an organization. And I actually went away and read some Darwin. And according to Darwin, mixed race marriage is a really, really good idea. Because if you have, you know, children of mixed race, they have healthy and more balanced immune systems, right? And if that's true, guys, it means number one, the Ku Klux Klan are idiots who are fighting a war on nature, they will never win. <laughs> and number two, it means everybody in the world and everybody in this room right now is a sexual racist. <laughs> and that's a bit awkward. Because we're not really, but we're brought up to think that a racist is born and a rapist and a fascist have a child. You know. <laughs> it's this very evil thing, you know. And, and I, look, I believe in equality, as I'm sure most of you do, but I've got to be honest with you guys. If I walk into a group of 20 something, you know, women in their 20s from Aders, India or Pakistan, my first thought is I wonder if any of them are single and would like to sleep with me. <laughs> if I walk into a group of men in their 70s or from Poland, that is not my first thought. <laughs> so I may believe in equality in some wonderfully highfalutin way, but quite honestly, uh, when it comes down to it, when my sexual brain's engaged, it turns out I'm ageist, sexist, and racist. <laughs> Which is a bit disturbing. Um, and obviously, I'm not saying we're all as bad as that. Of course, we're not all as bad as the Ku Klux They want a world of blonde haired, blue eyed Aryans. If I was in charge of the world, I'd want everyone to have access to education so we can all live together in you know, peace and tolerance and understanding without religion. So, you know, they want a world of blonde haired, blue eyed people. I want a world of liberal, middle class atheists just like me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of the same impulse. In a messed up sort of way. And, and I, guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I think it's important that we always look at our own, our own failings and so on. And, and actually, when I thought about this over a long period of time, I realized that you know, we're all told to think certain things like, oh, you know, you can't really believe, uh, you know, you can't question the financial system, or you're told that we can't, you know, no, you can't be racist, no, racism is bad and evil. And actually, the only way you could be completely colorblind in life is if you are totally ignorant of human history, right? Once you know about the great movements of people like the, the slave trade in Africa, which was brought over to America, or the conquistadors in South America, or the, the British Raj in India, once you know about that stuff, it has to inform how you see the world, right? And, and you know, I, 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 if you live in Ireland, it's incredibly transparent, because we've only had immigration for like 13 years, right? And, you know, most people who are immigrants in Ireland, a lot of them have come from places like China, Nigeria, uh, Poland, and they've come here to make better lives for themselves. And to be honest, most of them don't want to be stand-up comedians, so they don't threaten me economically in any way. <laughs> <laughs> so my narrative of immigration is incredibly positive. It's like, Jesus Christ, the girls in, the girls in Spar look amazing, don't they? Wow, is that just me? Anyone else No, I lost when I said Jesus Christ, didn't I? I lost one. <laughs> but, damn! It was gonna slip out sooner or later, wasn't it? <laughs> um, my, my, my alternative, as an Irish person, my, my cultural alternative to Holy Mother of God is Sweet Mother of Ted. <laughs> <laughs> Which I like. Um, but I realised that, that, that once, you, once you know the history of humanity, it's very hard. Uh, and that maybe if I was an English comedian, I would look at Dara O'Brien and, and, you know, Brendan Burns and Reginald D. Hunter and think, Feckin' immigrants coming over here, taking my geeks and, you know, our women, etc. Um, in large numbers, in all three of their cases. Uh, <laughs> as I understand. But, uh, but basically, what I think what I'm trying to say is, is, is you know, when you, the more you learn about the world, the more I think you learn to accept uh, your own failings and limitations in your own point of view, as well as everyone else's. And, and the thing, the, the idea of being colorblind, I think it's interesting that it comes to us from America. Because in my experience, lovely as they are, 
Americans are the most historically ignorant people I've ever met. And I'm not being racist when I say that, because Americans aren't a race. <laughs> also, because I can prove it to you, and I'll finish on this, because we're, we're at time, and you guys have been a really, really, thank you so much, you've been a really lovely audience. Um, but I'll finish on this. Um, does anyone here happen to know the leading brand of condoms in America? Trojans. Oh, quite a lot of very well <laughs> Skeptical audience, no problem saying that. Normally it's like women were looking around nervously in a small town in Ireland, someone going, does anyone know? Oh, I, I know, but I'm not going to achieve the test. <laughs> Thank you. That is correct, right? Tro is the answer. And I think, I think we can all appreciate the marketing angle. I'm like a horse, got wood, structures. <laughs> it's obvious, right? But, here's the thing, guys. If you know your history, when you think of Trojans, you think of an ingenious device designed to get you in somewhere you've been trying to get in for about 10 years. <laughs> but the moment you're inside, it bursts open. That's a bit of guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. And, um, I'm not going to try and talk about it. So starting again, half nine tomorrow morning. And look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Cheers and good night. Thank you.